I gotta go to this Okay, good afternoon. Okay, let's start this. So my name is Don Lukovic, I'm president of Tokyo Jolt. Every year, Tokyo Jolt sponsors a featured speaker. This year, we have the great pleasure and honor to sponsor Dr. Sandra Lee McKay. So please welcome her warmly. Can you hear me without the microphone? Yes. yes. Good, good. I think I'll do without that. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to talk today about the need for diversity and inclusion in textbooks in, in Japan. And I would imagine that all of you are very, you agree that diversity and inclusion in textbooks is needed and, and you would support that. The main question that I'm going to look at today is the question of what do we mean by diversity and even more importantly, what do we mean by inclusion? Because that's what's critical if we look at this whole concept of diversity and inclusion. For many people, diversity means you flip through a book, and you flip through your materials, and you see people of different ethnicities. And then you think, oh, we have diversity. But I'm going to argue that that is a very small, narrow part of diversity. So the central questions we're going to be looking at today is why are inclusion and diversity important? And some people might argue, do we really need that? But I think that today, given, first of all, the, um, the use of English as a linked language, as an international language, and the fact that we have constant migration between countries now, makes it all the more critical that we look at diversity and inclusion. The second thing I want to look at is to look at the idea of diversity and inclusion and to try to broaden the idea of diversity and also to look at what it means to be included in any kind of diversity. Remember that you can be included in several kinds of communities. You can be included in a global community and you can be included in a local, national community. Certainly the global community is far less painful because in many ways it's easy to be part of a global community. It doesn't mean you have anybody in your neighborhood living next to you that is diverse. It is when you have diversity next to you that it becomes a problem. And you can see this all around the world today as we get migration, we get diversity within different countries and communities. This is causing a great deal of problems. The third thing we're going to look at is how are diversity and inclusion depicted in Japanese ELT text. And here I'm going to draw on some existing research done by Matsuda, but I want to go beyond that and look at, at more current textbooks and how they are depicting diversity. And finally, I want to look at what might be some alternative ways of looking at diversity today, um, ones that aren't typically the ones we think of when we think of diversity. So I just want to make a brief point about why we want diversity today. And I think one of the main things is that at least in the literature, we talk about English as an international language. And I've certainly been a proponent of that. But I do want to say that yes, English has served the purpose interculturally and as a link language in many global situations, definitely among a higher elite, but it isn't within countries a link language. And this happens over and over again when we get migration and diversity within a country. It's not necessarily that English is going to get you very far. But if we look at English today, we see that uh, out of approximately 7.5 billion people, 1.5 billion people speak English. That's 20% of the world. Now that's certainly a large proportion, but that means 80% are not part of that. So we have to think about what is, who are the 80% that are not part of it. Um, and most of these people aren't L1 speakers. So we generally, and I made this point yesterday at my workshop, that most of the interactions that occur today in English are between L2 and L2 speakers. And that demands a different kind of expertise, a different kind of fluency than those between an L1 and an L2 speaker. Um, by most estimates then, there are 400 million L1 speakers, 300 million L2 speakers, and 750 million people like Japanese learners of English. So we have many people that do speak English, and this means that it will serve a link as a link language. And certainly, as I talked about yesterday in the workshop, the number of L2 speakers far su is surpasses that of L1. So the other thing that um, has of course fueled the spread of English and the fact that it's spoken by 20% of the population, not a small amount, is the fact that it is an official language in many, many countries. 
And so if you look at these countries, they are things like Australia and, but more importantly, Nigeria, Namibia, Kenya, Ghana, countries that when we think about diversity in our ELT text, we rarely see that diversity. We see the diversity generally of Caucasians. That's the diversity that we see in Japanese text. We have some Caucasians and that's our diverse population. A very, very narrow view of, of, of any kind of diversity. So, um, because it does serve in as many places as an official language, it does serve as a linked language. And I don't mean to minimize that, but I am going to argue today that we need to open our eyes and realize that English doesn't serve all the purposes it could for communication inter in, uh, across cultures. All right, so when English is used, we need to have cross-cultural sensitivity, and I talked about that in my workshop yesterday. So we want to have then cultural diversity on both an international, and I want to argue even more in national basis. We need to have our textbooks that have diversity, depicting the diversity that was, is within each country, Japan also included. So what do we mean by diversity and inclusion? Well, diversity is this idea we focus on differences, while inclusion is a deliberate act of welcoming diversity. So what do we mean by diversity? Well, diversity can be any characteristic used to differentiate a group of people. So as I said earlier, we often talk about diversity as ethnicity, and generally solely with ethnicity. And yet there are many other ways you can have diversity. You can have ethnicity based on gender, age, national origin, sexual orientation, physical attributes, things like um, whether or not you're handicapped, whether or not you're colorblind. These are all different ways of differentiating of diversity, of education, of religion, and certainly religion is a, a, something that differentiates, differentiates people today. And yet you see very, very few textbooks that will touch anything but ethnic diversity. Why? Because it's a safe topic. It's a safe topic, particularly when it's framed globally. Not as safe when it's framed nationally. And finally, um, so in many ELT textbooks, the focus is on ethnicity. And I'm going to show you that in some text that I looked at, that it's ethnicity that we see that's, that's differentiating people on a global level, not any other kind of, of diversity. And inclusion then is the act of making a person feel part of a group. So whatever that group is, they should feel part of it. That's what, when we talk about we want inclusion, we want inclusion, we want to make sure that our students feel part of that group. All right, so what does inclusion suggest for ELT textbooks? Well, as I said earlier, migration is paramount today. We have people generally moving between country and country. And they move for two reasons. They move generally by the pull factor, the idea that, oh, you know, life will be better. Life is hard here, but I can go. And the pull factor is generally among people who have the assets to make a choice that I don't want to live here because there are limited opportunities for me, but I want to live somewhere else. So the pull factor, when you go, when you migrate out of choice, you generally are able to go back to your own country. And that, it is occurring today, particularly on a professional level, but it's not occurring as much on those people that are being what is called push. Those people that look at their own situation and they say, I can't feed my children, it's not safe where I live, um, starvation, all kinds of things that say, I need to get to a better country. And even though it's going to be difficult for them to make the transition to another country, they're saying, I need to do it because there's no other alternative where I live. And those are the ones that migrate generally for manual labor. And in Singapore, they make an interesting distinction between foreign talent and foreign workers. So the foreign talent are people who are welcome. Yes, we want this diversity. Come to our borders, bring your expertise, and we want you. The foreign worker is someone, well, we need you because we need labor, but we don't really want you here. Just as, as a matter of fact, in Singapore, they do a good job of bringing in workers to build some of the huge construction projects that are going in Singapore, but they live in isolated areas that are restricted by the government, so they're out of sight, they're not integrated in this society, yet they're there, 
and you see them on Sundays trying to get some relaxation and, and be with other people from their own country. All right, so my migrants are coming to Japan. I'm going to be talking a lot about the number of migrants that are coming to Japan and the growing number of migrants that are coming to Japan. And they are coming both for professional on professional visas. Those are the ones that are the foreign talent. And they are coming for workers. And those are the ones that are coming as technical trainees. And both of them are coming. And if you live in, Japan, in Tokyo, you will see them very, um, they're there. They're there working in service industries and all kinds of other things. Because their labor is needed. Um, so, whatever the country, um, and, and I don't mean to pick on Japan, I think any country, whether it's Singapore, whether it's the United States, when, when it's uh, any other country, we need to look at, at diversity within the borders of that country because that's what's meaningful to the students. It's easy to read about a text of child labor in Africa or child labor in Cambodia, but it's, it's more painful and closer to home when you deal with the problems that exist in your own country. So what do we know about diversity and inclusion in Japanese texts? Well, as I said, one of the seminal studies on that was Matsuda's article in 2002. And she was trying to find out what are the ethnicities that are represented in, in ELT texts in Japan. And she found some interesting things. This was in a JAL journal, and it was, she was looking only at beginning level textbooks. So what she was looking at, she looked at the nationality of the main characters and the amount of English they used. So the nationality gave me some, some sense of how diversity was characterized in textbooks. And the amount of talk they did said something about who has the right to speak. Do I have the right to speak in Japan or not? Or you know, who can talk more in English? And um, the characters were categorized by whether they were from the inner circle, the inner circle meaning where native speakers are, the outer circle being where English is an official language like Singapore, the Philippines, or India, and the expanding circle being countries like Japan. And, what she, and, and she, these are the textbooks that she looked at, beginning level, looking for both the characters and how much they, they, they spoke. And this is what she found, that in the textbooks, if you'll notice in terms of the nationality of the main characters and the number of words they spoke, that of Japanese characters in the book, there were 34, and they spoke on average 2,844 or that that was the number of words. Whereas the inner circle, mainly people from the United States or Great Britain, they were flew fewer in number, but they were equal in amount of that they spoke. So, and if you look at the outer circle, any depiction of diversity in the sense of, here are speakers from Singapore, here are speakers from the Philippines, here are speakers from another thing, they were barely represented at all. Any. Uh, expanding circle countries other than Japan, something like China or Korea, people who are very prevalent here in Japan, um, they were only five speakers and very few words, and then the unknown. So by and large, the characters were either native speakers of English, Japanese, and they were the ones that dominated the diversity that was in textbooks. Um, if we look at the context of English uses, that most of the exchanges took place in Japan. And, and remember that this was 2002. So it was the idea that, okay, we've got a native speaker coming to Kyoto, and somebody is going to interview them and ask them, all right, um, you know, what was your favorite spot when you visited Kyoto? Or what, was, what do you like to do in Japan? So these were the kind of dialogues between native speakers and Japanese speakers. Um, some of them were inner circle where a, a Japanese student would go study abroad and then they were going to be talking about interacting with their American host family or their British host family and they were the ones that were doing the talking. Alright, um, there was uh, outer circle countries other than Japan, there was zero. Um, expanding circle countries like Japan, uh, uh, China or Korea, only five multi-context where they went to maybe Australia, then they went to Singapore, and then they came home. But by and large, the diversity that existed was the um, Caucasian coming to Japan and speaking English. 
And then her, the general conclusion of her study was that in the beginning level textbooks, diversity was mainly represented by Caucasians. So again, this was 2002. Mainly the textbooks, when there was anything other than Japanese, were Caucasians. Um, and, and this was only ethnicity. She didn't look at anything else. The characters from outer circle countries or expanding circle countries were rarely represented. And there was little then representation of international diversity other than Caucasians. All right, so what I was curious about is what has happened since 2002. And so I took the textbooks that I think are wide, fairly widely used, and I looked specifically for the diversity that was in them. And so I looked at um, intermediate level text. And I was looking not only on the basis of uh, ethnicity, but also on other factors such as disability, gender, and class. So is there any other kind of diversity represented in ELT text today? And so I looked at New Horizon, New Crown, English Now, and Sunshine. So I realized this was not a scientific study. These are, there are many, many other textbooks, but these were approved by the ministry, and they are used fairly widely. So I was looking then for this kind of representation. So I looked first at ethnic, ethnic diversity. And I found that there was a, a lot of ethnic diversity in the sense there weren't only Caucasians. There were people from Cambodia and there were people from uh, uh, Bangladesh and things like that. But it was an international context. So it was the ethnicity out there. It was the ethnicity that we see in, in developing countries. That was portrayed, and it was portrayed as a social issue. Social issues seem to dominate a lot of ELT texts in Japan, particularly when it is dealing with ethnic diversity. So the Japanese textbooks frequently depicted ethnic diversity through discussions of social causes out there. And since they are depicted on an international level, they really didn't deal with inclusion. What they were instead is they were ethnicity, they were diversity, but the diversity was out there. And that's very different, that's comfortable. It's not as comfortable when that ethnic diversity, as I said earlier, is right here. So some of the examples then was here was, it was interesting, there were two readings on landmines. And this one, it was Princess Diane, and she was leading this whole expedition on landmines and talking about the devastation it's causing on ch to children and how important it is to volunteer and how deadly the landmines were as a social issue, a social issue out there. Another one was the landmines in Cambodia. And it says, Cambodian children like to play in forests and fields just like you and me, but some of them are killed and others are injured. Landmines do this. So here's a perfect example of ethnic diversity ethnic diversity of, you know, something other than Caucasian, so it's not just Caucasians, but it is an a, a ethnic diversity of a cause out there, that you feel this is terrible what's happening, and it is terrible, and I don't mean to minimize that at all, but it's a comfortable differentiation of ethnic diversity. It's that we can look at that, we can sympathize, we can say, oh, that is too bad that the Cambodian children are suffering, but it's different than saying, these Cambodian children are now here next to me, now what do I do? That's something that we want, I mean, textbook publishers want safe topics, and that's not a safe topic, and yet it is critical if we're going to deal with diversity in, in this present day. The other thing here is another one of ethnic diversity, and it was Free the Children. And this was a very nice reading about a 12-year-old Canadian young man who saw this ad, this uh, uh, headline in a paper in Canada about the murder of a 12-year-old Bangladeshi, uh, Bangladeshi worker. And he had worked in uh, the, the factory, manufacturing things, since he was four years, four years old, because his parents had sold him into child labor at four. So at 12, he had worked now as eight years as a laborer, and he, was, um, he finally was fed up, and he started protesting that there shouldn't be child labor. And so then he was murdered for protesting. And this 12-year-old Canadian, uh, apparently a true story, was that he was very upset by that because he realized this was the, someone who was the same age as he was, 
who had been murdered because of child labor. And so he began a movement among uh, young people in Canada called Free the Children. And the idea was to try to demonstrate, try to raise money <coughs> against child labor in other countries, in developing countries. So it, it is an important social issue. It brings in ethnic diversity in a very critical way, but it is an ethnic diversity that is out there that you then can't be included in a Japanese context. Um, so another way that ethnic diversity um, enters in is through heroism. And I found that there were several textbook examples that heroism was important. There was one example of a Japanese woman who had competed in the Olympic Games. Sorry, I can't remember her name. But um, she had come in almost at the end of the competition. And so the moral to the whole, it, it talked about her competing and how she was hard for the, this young Japanese woman to get in the Olympic competition. She didn't come in very near the top, matter of fact, pretty near the bottom. But the moral to the whole reading was, it doesn't matter if you win or lose, it's trying. <coughs> so it was, it had a social issue, a social motivation, but it, it didn't have any diversity, it was a Japanese woman. But this particular example was heroism and it was ethnic diversity. So this was an Afghan young woman who uh, was uh, her mentor, her, her teacher, had been uh, trying to run in the Olympics under the Taliban. And under the Taliban, women were not allowed to you know, uh, do any kind of competition. They were not allowed to run, certainly. And so her mentor never was able to stand for the Olympics. So after the Taliban were no longer powerful in, or as powerful in, Af if, Af in Afghanistan, um, this young woman was able, became part of the group of her mentor that trained to be part of the Olympic runners. And she was the first Afghan woman to ever compete in the Olympic Games as a runner. Well, the, the, she competed, and she also came in very near the end. But the idea was that, OK, I tried, and I represented my country. I'm a woman now from Afghanistan, and I have competed, and I'm proud of it. So it was, again, a very, very nice story. It was ethnic diversity, but it was a global ethnic diversity and international, and it was one that is a fairly comfortable one. Um, then there was ethnicity through fiction. Um, and because basically what I was doing as I looked through the text was looking for depictions of ethnic diversity. And so there was one that was an international, it was a fiction. And so this was about Mongolia. And it was a folk tale about the typical instrument of Mongolia. And it was talking about how it came to be. And it was because the child, Suho, had a white horse. And the white horse he was very close to. And he trained it and so forth. And then it got to be very good and competitive as a horse. And so then the king took the horse because he was going to have a horse for his competitions. And then the horse was so sad it died and then, or it, it got, it, it almost died, and it made it back though to Suho, and he died, the horse died right next to Suho, and Suho then was so upset by the horse, but he had a dream, and the dream said, look, um, if you uh, take my, my bones, you take my marrow, you take my skin, you take my hair, make me an instrument, and that will be the, the, the instrument that sings throughout Mongolia. And so here it was then, this was, you know, the, the instrument of Mongolia. So ethnic diversity, a very wonderful fictional character, know, way of depicting it. Um, then there was physical diversity. And I, that I found very, very nice that it was physical diversity because every country deals with, with disabilities, with physical diversity, and yet we rarely see that in textbooks. And yet those are people that you want included. So this was physical diversity in an international context. And this was a woman from Sweden. She was apparently a very, very well-known um, Swedish singer. And she didn't have any arms. But um, the story was how she became a very well-known singer, went all over the world. And, and the, the world that she had was she said, uh, perhaps I look different on the outside. But I just do what everybody does with my feet instead of my hands. And so she wanted to say that I am normal. Why do people look at me as not normal? I'm normal. And, and I think this is something that more and more textbooks should have, that if we mean um, diversity, 
then why not, this is another element of diversity. But again, the diversity was out there. It was in Sweden. It wasn't what is the diversity that exists in Japan today? What is the heroism and, and the, the struggles of those that have disability in Japan today? Then um, they had the, the social class, and that I'm sure that you've heard several um, uh, discussions of that in other uh, uh, talks at the um, conference, where we deal with this upper middle class bias of ELT texts. That we, in terms of, of economic diversity, textbooks are not going to touch economic diversity. And yet, economic diversity is rampant throughout the world. I, I have to say, I was looking this up for the talk, and I did find that Japan is one of the lowest rates of gap between the rich and the poor. So you have far less of that economic diversity than, say, something like the United States, which has one of the largest gaps between the rich and the poor. Nonetheless, it seems to me we want to have economic diversity of something. All right, so when you see that, you see that this class diversity, that here is a homestay, Carlo, you mustn't compare your host family. He was very upset because his friend had a better host family than he did in the United States. You can find interesting things around your home. And then there's a picture of his home. Well, yes, there are homes like that in the United States, and, and maybe that's where some of the, the homestays go, but there are many, many homes that are far more modest, or apartments or something else, but we have this. And then when we're, we're talking about developing the vocabulary, we have a, a fairly, um, definitely middle class, upper middle class house. And we also have um, a, a non-Japanese context, that this is what, it's like the global world out there is everything that is upper economic class. The global world out there isn't anything that might have any, any economic diversity. And even in terms of leisure activities, where it's things like um, make plastic models, take pictures, travel, play video games, um, that's certainly something that young people of a certain economic background can do. But if you go to places like Thailand or other Vietnam, not all children have that. And so we need different kinds of diversity, both globally and nationally. All right, so ethnic diversity now within Japan. And I found only two examples of that. And one of them was um, the Ainu. And um, there was the picture of the Ainu. These young people were going to a festival, an Ainu festival in Hokkaido. And they had some typical Ainu dishes. And then they were, um, the, I'm sorry, I forget the name of the, the instrument, the Ainu instrument, but they heard the Ainu instrument. So, the Ainu were represented, but they were represented in somewhat of um, a superficial level. And I see this all the time in the uh, United States, where we have many, many Mexican Americans. And if they have Ethnic Day, what they celebrate is the piñata and the food and the characteristics. But it's a, it's a superficial kind of recognition of the diversity that exists, where we can talk about customs, we can talk about costumes, we can talk about instruments, but that's about as far as we go. It's a, it's a safe topic to talk about that. So this was one. What is not safe? Hmm? What topics aren't safe? Well, I think religion isn't safe. I, I think things like that aren't safe. I mean, for Mexicans. For Mexicans, you don't want to talk about you know, um, deportation. You don't want to talk about separation of families. Those are unsafe topics that you probably wouldn't deal with in an ELT textbook. But you, you, you're saying we should deal with it. Well, I'm saying I, I want to raise the question, should we? Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure. I mean, that's something I've been struggling with. Should we? Is that something we're supposed to do? Is it something that comes in social studies better? Um, but if we're going to be talking about language and cross-cultural discussions, then it seems to me somewhere we need to raise that. That that's part of, of dealing with the diversity that exists in a country. And where that happens, I'm not sure, but I think it needs to happen. And, and what I'm seeing in ELT textbooks is, yes, there is diversity, but it's a comfortable diversity. And, and I really don't think, I, I think we're at a point in the world today where we can't be a comfortable diversity. You know, it's got, there's really important, difficult issues, and they need to be dealt with. You mean because of social injustice? Well, yes, in some, to some extent, yeah. All right, so another one, this was a very interesting one. It was the Japanese context. Ethnicity was not explicitly addressed, and yet it seems to me it was a really good example of ethnic diversity within Japan. And this was, perhaps you've heard of them, Sutomu, 
and he's a famous um, or well-known singer. If you Google him, you'll hear many, many of his songs. He's Okanawan. And so the story of him takes place that he was, his father was Mexican-American, his mother was Japanese. And he, um, they left him when he was at birth, or very, very soon after. Didn't say why. Um, and he himself was blind from birth. And then he lived with his grandmother. So he lived with his grandmother in Okinawa. And then when he was in his teenage years, he heard a minister singing, and he become, became enthralled with the idea of singing. He then went to live with the minister, and he started um, singing himself. He had a voice trainer, an Italian voice trainer, and he ended up quite well known. I mean, I didn't ever hadn't heard of him before, but when I did Google him, there were all kinds of YouTube videos on his music. Very, very beautiful voice. So um, here is a man who, you know, struggled, who came from an ethnic diversity background, and yet. That was just mentioned as this is, this is his par parents, and that was it. So it was completely dropped. And yet, it might have been interesting to see how is he treated as someone who was of uh, mixed racial background and, and that kind of thing. That wasn't the issue at all. All right, so this is the kind of ethnicity and, or diversity that I saw in these textbooks. And I wanted to juxtapose, juxtapose, juxtapose uh, sorry, just put those, compare those with um, the differences between what the statistics say and what you see in the textbooks. All right, so this is a very interesting article, Migration Information Source, and it talks about the diversity within Japan today. And when you see what's happening in terms of the diversity within Japan, it seems like textbooks want to, should deal with this. And again, I'm saying not necessarily in English classes, but perhaps in some other kinds of uh, discussion forum, uh, other classes. So obviously, and this is talked about a lot throughout all kinds of literature, is the rapidly aging society in Japan. And so that one, one quarter of the population is 65 years and older, and that will continue to increase for some time. And so to meet this labor shortage, since 1990, the government has turned to immigration because the labor shortage, we need people to take care of the older, older uh, generation, and we also need people, young people, to build the high-rises, to uh, serve in the restaurants, to do all these things. Japan has a labor shortage. So um, in so doing, in, in opening migration in 1990, the resident foreign workforce has grown by 40% since 2013. So that's a large increase in the foreign population in Japan. Um, so the, the increase is from 0.7, in, uh, 0 0.7 of the total population in 1990 to 1.8 in 2016. And that seems like, well, that's not very much. That's just you know a little fraction of a, a percent. But then when you get that, while the proportion is small, in, uh, in the 1990, 1990, there were 900,000 uh, foreign population. In 2016, um, that went to 2.3 million. So you have a 160% increase in the number of foreigners that are now living in Japan. That's a big increase. And that's one that people will notice because that there is now ethnic diversity, not just out there, but in here. All right, so if you see the increase here, you can see that there's quite a rise. And it started in about 1990, and it's been increasing. And will, by all statistics and all projections, continue to increase. All right, so uh, what is the immigration policy? And I found it was interesting because while I've been here, uh, the Japan Times has, has run several articles about the current immigration policy and how it's going to be updated and expanded. So the immigration traces its roots back to the 1950s. And um, the immigration system permits a variety of work-related visas, such as professor, professors, journalists, and specialists in uh, humanities. So since 1952, the professional immigration has been open, and there's no closing in terms of the resident, the, the length of stay here. And that's what, I, when, what in Singapore is called foreign talent. So Japan is very welcome to have welcoming foreign talent, 
whether they're professors or journalists or whatever, they can come, you can come, and you can stay. And very often those professionals are Caucasians coming from the United States or UK or Western Europe. All right, so most categories are on cap, so you can get as many professors according to this immigration policy, as many journalists and specialists in humanities that you want. Um, now, if you look at by visa status, you can see that the permanent long-term residence at the top there is growing. But the ones that are interesting are the population of the students, that one is continuing to rise, and the other one is the technical trainees. And the technical trainees are the really interesting ones because they're continuing to increase. And that's the one that Avi wants to increase even more. So they are continuing to go up. So the other ones tend to be going down. But you've got more, more permanent residents coming, you've got more students and more technical trainees coming. Students tend to be by many, many coming from China. And the technical trainees, we'll see in a minute, are coming from a variety of countries. So the unskilled labor, the foreign workers. So in 1990, the Immigration Act was uh, it, uh, expanded. It excluded unskilled laborers in principle. It said we're not going to have unskilled laborers coming to Japan. But by allowing the entrance of the, the Brazilians of Japanese in, uh, ancestry, um, it opened a lot of unskilled labor. And they came and they settled and worked in factories. And and when they first came, they were here to stay, but then many of them uh, went and returned back to Brazil or Peru. All right, so um, the Nathan population peaked at about 375, or close to 25, 20% of the foreign population. So for a while, they were the, the foreign labor. Um, but what's, this is the one that's interesting and is currently being discussed in Japan today, this idea of a technical training program that in 1990 opened its doors to unskilled labor. And the idea was that it was supposed to be short-term workers, mainly from Asian countries, to learn about Japanese business practices and to bring those back home. So the idea of the technical training program was, yes, come and learn about uh, uh, building construction, highway construction, uh, factory workers, come and, and work find out how it's done here, go back to your own country, and then you can do it there. And that was the idea. But, although that's what the policy says, my understanding from what I've read is that that policy is not being enforced. So technical trainees are coming in, getting jobs in service, in unskilled labor, but they are staying. And so in practice, the program often works in the way of bringing in cheap labor to undertake menial tasks. And this, by the way, is happening in many, many developed countries around the world today. I mean, one of the reasons that the United States has the problem that we have in terms of immigration is because we want cheap labor, but we don't want to recognize it. So what they do is they come in, they work as migrant workers, they come in illegally, they're, they're needed. The California couldn't exist without unskilled, uh, with, without the, the labor of Mexican Americans who come and work in the fields, who work in the service industry, but we don't want to recognize it. And I think that's all countries are doing that. We want it, we want labor, but we don't want ethnic diversity, and we certainly don't want you to stay here. And so uh, the United States is probably the prime example of the kind of the ambiguity of the program where we're just closing our eyes to the reality of the need for labor. Um, and so in 2016, this group comprised 10% of the foreign population. So the, the article I read just what was it, November 14th in the Japan Times was getting back to the technical trainee. And so they're considering of increasing the workforce of the technical training from 260,000 to 340,000. And so it, as the Japan Times said, it's a drastic policy shift for Japan and paves the way for an influx of blue collar foreign workers, enabling some of them to work for potentially indefinite periods of time. So if this policy is enacted, you will certainly have more and more people here who do not speak uh, Japanese and who will be asked to take English. And I think that's, I've been talking with some people here at the conference, and that's it's an interesting um, educational issue that's going to have to be dealt with, is if they're going to come and work and perhaps stay for a long time, Japanese is critical. No question, Japanese is critical. But the question is, are they going to then be required to learn English? 
And is English really serve as a link language? Is it really needed here? That's a really important educational issue that has to be addressed. And, and that an issue that I think needs to be talked about and that uh, young people need to be aware that there are going to be people in their classes that are not Japanese and don't speak Japanese and they're in their classes. And this is the ethnic diversity that they're going to experience that is not out there but is in here. And so the ethnic profile of foreigners, um, more diverse than in the past, um, prior to 1990, they were mainly of Korean ancestry or Chinese ancestry. Um, then they you know, came to be of Peruvian or Brazilian ancestry. But today, it's more Filipino, Vietnamese, Nepalese, and Thai. And this is what the, the um, graph that I found extremely interesting, because you can see that Korean population is increasing, but the one that is increasing tremendously is the Chinese and Taiwanese population. Um, also, the uh, uh, Vietnam population, the Philippine, the Filipino um, population is increasing. The Brazilian population is decreasing as many are returning home. So what you're getting now is a much more diverse group of ethnic diversity here. And that would be Vietnam, Vietnamese, Filipino, Chinese, and Taiwanese. That's who's going to be here and is going to be in other in Japanese students' classrooms. And that is where the ethnic diversity, as I said, is going to be right here. So the, the, what, what is depicted now in the literature is very different than what you're getting in textbooks, where textbooks deals with a very comfortable diversity and limited diversity, but not one that allows inclusion. So if you're going to have inclusion, you've got to define your social group that's one that students could potentially be included in, or at least you know, aware of. And that's one that textbooks um, in Japan, and I don't mean it at all to say this is only in Japan, it's happening around the world, that we're just closing our eyes to what's happening, and yet that's going to be something that has to be dealt with. And young people particularly are going to need to deal with it because they're going to be the ones that are faced with it long term. So. Um, while the foreign residents continue to make up only 2% of the population, they're generally in urban areas. So uh, it may be that in some of the smaller communities it isn't uh, as prevalent, but if you get into places like Tokyo and Osaka, you definitely will see it. And when I was in Tokyo last week, I certainly saw a lot more diversity than I ever had in the past. So they're there, they're working in different um, areas, and I was talking with a young woman who's working in one of these adult education centers where they're getting their high school degree, um, they're working to get their high school degree, and as many of them are Vietnamese, Filipino, trying to get their degree and having to take English in addition to Japanese and struggling because they know Vietnamese, they know Filipino, they're struggling to learn Japanese, and yet the curriculum is saying you have to learn English. And so it's a very, very difficult situation for those particular students. Um, so in conclusion, I think if we want to include, um, if we really want ethnic diversity and inclusion to mean anything in a meaningful way, um, both to the, 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 to the students, to the young people, that it's got to be in a diversity and inclusion that includes the here and now. And that's one that I think is uncomfortable and one that we often don't want to deal with. And it's so much easier to just say, let's have that great diversity out there in the global world. And it, it's very comfortable. Um, and yet Japan um, is not dealing with the diversity that exists. And certainly the United States is closing its eyes to the diversity and, and, and not dealing with it as an issue that needs to be dealt with. Um, but if, if Japan were willing to do so, if it looked within ethnic diversity within its border, it would be able to deal critically with the growing diversity that exists within Japan today. And so finally, I think inclusion can only be depicted in the EL textbooks. Only diversity within a country's borders is portrayed. And that's going to be a far more problematic, difficult, painful process to talk about diversity and inclusion in that context rather than in the way most textbooks do. So, um, you know, it's, it's an issue I feel strongly about and it's not, not an issue that is at all, you know, just a Japanese issue. It's an issue that is existing around the world today. And it's one that 
somehow I'm still struggling with how does English fit into this growing diversity, this growing immigration and migration. And that's something that I think we as a profession need to talk about. That, okay, what is the role of English, particularly when you get young people like the Vietnamese and the Filipino here in Japan and some of the, the immigrants coming to the United States? I mean, that, that's a different thing because English is the host language, but in Japan and in China and every place else where there's growing ethnic diversity, growing linguistic diversity, what's the role of English in those contexts? And that's something that I think really needs to be discussed. So thank you, and I'd be very happy to entertain any questions and any, any discussion that you have. But thank you very much. Problem because they use those people for cheap labor, but at the same time they don't recognize them. Well, it is. I mean, in a way, the labor that comes, they come because of a push factor, right? Those people that come to Japan or come to the United States would rather be in their own country with their own people, with their own language, and they come because there's very little other alternative. So they come and they fulfill a, a critical function within that society. But they aren't necessarily welcome, and they certainly aren't included in the, you know, the um, whole discussion, the discourse of that country. Do you think that they're dehumanized? Depends on the context. Can be, and, and maybe not. Thank you very much. Um, very input very informative in, uh, um, talk and um, all the information um, is so useful for um, the language teachers. Um, I, I just want to add because um, I think currently the discourse about um, in, uh, uh, bringing in um, unskilled labor um, or the people who um, come from mainly uh, Vietnam, um, China, uh, Philippines, and so forth. Okay. Um, the main uh, political discourse is how to um, provide them with Japanese language um, instruction and how do we ensure their Japanese language proficiency. And there's no, I have heard, no discussion of how do Japanese people can, uh, you know, communicate with them in English? So there, I think the con concept of English as an international language is really um, not addressed at all. It's just, um, you know, collapsed. <laughs> and so um, it's very um, problematic um, to talk about English as an international language. And it's almost like um, English is international language when Japanese people talk to um, white people who visit Japan, or Japanese people go to um, you know, inner circle countries to interact with people there. That's international. I think I agree with you. In order to address inclusion, I think we need to um, you know, rethink and problematize this concept of international or global and really look at um, the local um, internationalization or localization or whatever we call it. And then how do we um, reconceptualize English and communication and how do we um, sort of raise our awareness of multilingualism rather than just, you know, elf English as an international language and so forth. I think we need to go beyond English and also um, beyond um, just you know communication in English. It's communication overall in multi um, multilingual, multicultural um, settings. So I just wanted to add. No, I, I totally agree with you, and and I don't mean to work us all out of a job. I mean we want to be able to teach English, right? That's what we do here. Um, and, and certainly English does serve a function, but I always think of English as an elite language, and it is, in fact. You know, so it's an elite language, and it does serve a purpose uh, in an elite circle uh, for trade, for diplomacy, for all kinds of things. Um, so it is important in that way. There's no question about it. But you know, and I, of all people who have for a long time said, oh, international, lang international English and so forth, Yes, it is, but, but I'm, I'm beginning more and more as I see, particularly the migration happening 
that it's very limited in its function, at least within borders, and that we really need to uh, look at that more carefully, particularly the requirement of English as a foreign language in most countries around the world today. Is that really something that we want? I mean, is it something, I mean, and it has to be decided in the borders, by the ministry, by the teachers, um, by the parents, is that something that we want? And I think almost any country you ask today, do you want your young, your young child to learn English? They would say yes. And they say yes because they believe it's a key to economic and social mobility. That if my young child does well in the English exam here in Japan, they'll get into a good university. They get into a good university, they'll get a good job, they'll be successful. And so that's what keeps parents you know, fueling the idea that my children have to have English. But if you look at a broader view of, again, migration, diversity within countries, we really need to, to deal more with the idea that we need to know how to communicate um, in, in various kinds of uh, different contexts using different languages. And we have to look at the context to determine what language is important. And it's not, many, many times, it's not going to be English. And that, of course, as I said, you know, it could work us out of a job that people are saying, no, we don't need to, I mean, here in Japan, maybe you need Mandarin more as you get more and more. And I noticed that uh, more and more tourist areas are getting Mandarin as a translation in addition to English. So whether I was around Kyoto, there were many, many buses and things like that that now had things in Mandarin. And, and um, one young Japanese I talked to who was very good in English, I said, oh, you could get a job at a, at a hotel. And she said, oh, I couldn't get a really good job today at a hotel unless I spoke Mandarin and you know English, but Mandarin also. So more and more that's getting to be a language of importance, in, particularly in Asia and Southeast Asia, that that's going to be a very, very important language. So maybe it should be, yes, you're required to take a foreign language, but leave it as a choice. All right, in Japan, maybe you want to take Mandarin as your foreign language. Maybe you want to take Vietnamese or some other language. But you have a choice instead of around the world it being English. Mm -hmm. I find that my experience teaching these newer immigrants from Southeast Asia um, at my university and also talking to them in my community, generally their English is better than a lot of the Japanese students. So it's a matter of the Japanese students catching up with them, in a sense. Because a lot of the students I work with from Southeast Asia, um, they came to Japan with pretty good English skills, depending on where their home country is and what their high school was. I see it almost as the Japanese students needing to catch up with them as far as English. Certainly that's true, especially like in the Philippines. If you come from an elite family in the Philippines, your English is probably and wonderful. And you had it as your L1. Right. Probably. Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Myanmar, these students are doing it with English. A but that again is an elite group coming to study at a university. Maybe, maybe not. A lot of them are here on scholarship. Yeah. Whether they're elite or not, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the ones that are here are skilled laborers working in the service industry, in the convenies. I don't know, but generally I find their English not bad as well. They're not getting support in learning Japanese the way they need to be. The Mabusho lost 300,000 by 2020, but they give them very little support socially, academically, linguistically for Japanese language. Yes. Okay. Um, I I have uh, seen some classes where a lot of immigrant children are studying English with many other Japanese students. And interestingly, or ironically, some teachers give up using published English textbooks because they are kind of useless. Uh, so the students have the textbooks uh, signed, but the, the teachers don't use it. So, um, so instead of that, we just started to use, uh, they started to make their own spreadsheets with information um, on, you know, diverse cultural uh, things, like using the um, artifact Christmas um, ornament, or ornament from the Philippines or something. Um, so I wonder, how, um, but this is kind of a question or some comment, but um, I wonder, the meanings of textbooks, 
themselves. Um, because, you know, on the political level or legal level, all the students have to buy textbooks, most of them are free. Um, but in, uh, in the reality, they are not being used in some cases, especially in this kind of multilingual, multicultural context. So, yeah, that comment in, maybe you can have some thought on that. Right, well, I guess because they have to take English, right, in your context where they're required to take English because they're trying to pass the high school exam, right, in an alternative situation. So they have to. And that's where I think it, it, it warrants looking critically at this idea of should English be required throughout the world, particularly as an exit exam for a high school diploma in Japan. That, and that's not just in Japan, but in many other countries. Is, is it going to be necessary, or should we be, in, should countries be requiring English to be such an important language for mobility? Particularly because these young people that are coming here, they really need Japanese more than anything to be able to survive and work here. Japanese levels vary, yeah. so they, the textbooks are written mainly in Japanese. They can read right. the textbooks, and the English levels among students vary a lot too. So the, the level is not that does not fit anyone there. Yeah, yeah. So that's a huge problem. Well, and, and the task they have to, to uh, undertake to get fluent in reading in Japanese is huge. And so, you know, if you have limited time, limited resources, because many of them are working in the context you're in, then put it towards getting literate in Japanese, because that's what's going to allow them to at least have some kind of a functional level here in Japan. Well, thank you very much, and I hope I've raised some questions.